Hello, folks. We are concluding Leadership Week a little bit after it was supposed to happen because of my internet failure back on the day. But in the end, I was just saying to our guest, I think it's quite fitting to talk about Eisenhower on the last show of, I, of Leadership Week because at the end of the day, he was at the very top. Arguably, even Churchill and George VI and Roosevelt were under his command in the sense that by 1944, he is mobilizing the world's forces. So there is no human being with more responsibility than Eisenhower in that summer. So um, it'll be a great chat. So my guest tonight, um, if you haven't already seen him on World War II TV, go back and look for the incredible war games, video games and board games show we did where he was a star panelist. So uh, retired Colonel John uh, Antal, so how, how, to, how are you doing this evening, John? Are you well? Paul, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It, it is a uh, great honor again to be with you. Well, thank you very much. And in terms of leadership, you have led men in the military. You have written about leadership and you've lectured about leadership and you have seen it in all shapes and forms. So you you know how to recognize a good leader when you see one. And Eisenhower is, you know, as we will discover, arguably one of the best leaders the world has ever had. But what we want to analyze tonight is what made him a good leader. How, how was his leadership um, developed? Did he kind of have it naturally was it a skill he worked on this isn't going to be a, a biography of eisenhower folks if you want that just read carlo deste's book or go on wikipedia this is about how he acquired the skills that make gave him so so su such success so um what, what i'm assuming john that you can you know you you were an early fan of eisenhower as a kid i'm sure you know like myself you know you, you must have read those classic hits his in your country martin blumenson those kind of people carlo deste her writing about him so in my case, it was it was Robin Nylans and Max Hastings and those authors. But most historians agree he is, you know, unrivaled in terms of leadership. So you, you did you recognize that early? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, for instance, General Eisenhower, much like General Ulysses Simpson Grant, you know, the great general of our American Civil War. Uh, these are figures that rose from uh, from the American uh, lower class and. And from, just from a, being a mere good Americans, I mean, they were just people who, who didn't have privilege or power, but they rose based on their merit. So it's a great American story. So the Eisenhower story is, is the story of a young man who's born in Texas, you know, goes off to uh, uh, live in, um, in Kansas when his parents move, eventually goes to West Point, becomes a professional soldier. I mean, doesn't go to World War I. He doesn't have any of the fame and the glory of a MacArthur or a Patton. And yet he ends up leading the most important events of the Second World War, particularly in the European theater. And then later on in life, NATO commander and then president of the United States. I mean, yeah. so this is a story about merit and it's a story about leadership. So if you want to learn about leadership, Eisenhower is a great, great place to start. I mean, this is a person who, you know, didn't have anything going for him other than his, his, his heart, his, his character, his commitment and his competencies. And, and one of the things that, that all of us need to, to do when we talk about leadership is let's define it. You know, as, as you know well, I, I like to say that Socrates said that all understanding starts with definition. So what is leadership? Now, this is a question you should ask yourself because most of you, all of you, are leaders. You're leaders of your family or of your little team or, or of your community or or maybe even more, you know, business and other things. So all of you are leaders in some aspect, and there are people that look up to you for leadership. But it's really amazing how many people don't even have an understanding of what leadership is, because if you ask them, what is leadership? Their answer is, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. And well, that's not, you that's said that because, because Martin Harley always say, has already said in the sidebar, is he a leader or a manager? I mean, and it's it's terminology, isn't it? I mean, well, that's very they good. Are, they are they are overlapping those factors. Yeah, we need wrong. to talk. That is a very good question, a brilliant question. We need to talk about the difference between leadership and the management. But let's talk about the definition of leadership. Now, I believe that each one of you, everyone who's listening today, and everyone who watches this, you should have your own personal definition of leadership. It's not about adopting somebody else's leadership definition. It's about you having your own, because if you don't have it in your heart and you don't have it in your head, then you're just mimicking someone else. It's not real. It's trans. It's it's fake. You, they'll see that. So you have to be able to say what leadership is. 
Now, you need to spend some time thinking about it. So what I recommend you do, and everyone who's watching this who, who wants to do this right now, I suggest you do this little drill. Take out a piece of paper, I know, you know, or you take out your, your iPad or whatever you've got, you know, go digital and uh, type out, you know, or write out your single definition of discipline, the correction, definition of leadership for, uh, you know, in a couple of sentences, no more than a paragraph. And if you can't do that, you haven't thought about it very much. In fact, that's true of almost anything. But if you can't do that for leadership, then, and you lead every day someone, then it's really telling. Now, go ahead and do that. Write that down and, and, and actually say leadership is. And, and think about what you do as a leader. And what is leadership to you? So that if someone comes up to you and they say, okay, I've been following you now for two years or five years, and I really am impressed by your leadership. What is this leadership stuff? And you say, well, I hadn't thought about it much. I mean, that's not very that's not very reinforcing because what you want to do is you want to inspire people, you want to impel people, you want to get people to to work with you, and they want to know that you're you, that you're the kind of person that has uh, the kind of leadership they want. So I'll, let me give you my definition of leadership because I've thought about it for a very long time. I believe leadership is the art of influence and a sacred trust. I will not let you down. A sacred trust. It is the ability to get people to impel people to work together to accomplish a goal or a mission. And it consists of three very important factors. It consists of character, competencies, and commitment. Now, that's my definition of leadership. And I can use that leadership in anything, uh, analyze any situation, and also to, to, re to uh, sort of uh, raise my own bar so that I can look at the, uh, the, the things that I've done as a leader and say, okay, this is where I fail. This is where I need to work harder. This is where I need to, to be better. So let's just talk about that for a second, that definition, because Eisenhower epitomizes that definition to me. I mean, leadership is the art of influence. Eisenhower influenced people in amazing ways. Now you can influence people by compelling or by impelling. Compelling means do it or you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Impelling means I inspire you to do it. You know, I, I propel you to do it because of my, my, uh, my leadership by example and other things. So Eisenhower was an impelling, not a compelling leader. Many leaders, particularly when they have, you know, absolute power, like Joseph Stalin, he was a compelling leader. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have to impel anybody. He just said, do it or I'll shoot you. And you had then a couple of choices. You could either do it or you could be shot. Um, so that was compelling. Now, Eisenhower was in a totally different situation. And later on, we need to talk about the different levels of leadership because Eisenhower was at the top of that leadership game. And there's some really interesting things that all of us can learn from with, with Eisenhower's uh, yeah. leadership. But let's look at the, the definition again. So the ability to influence people and to impel them to get things done. That's really critical because if you can do that, you can do almost anything in life. I mean, so many people uh, have trouble working with other people, have trouble working with teams, have trouble getting people to follow them. And that's because partially they haven't looked at what their leadership consists of and how they can improve themselves. Improve yourself in leadership. That's how you learn to be a leader. And that's what Eisenhower did. Eisenhower worked every day to be a better leader. And he did it in many different ways, but he particularly grew as a leader as he, as he learned and gained wisdom over time. Now, three components of, of leadership that I say are, are crucial is character, competency, and commitment. Now, character, character is vital. If you don't have character, you can fool some of the people most of the time, but eventually they're gonna find out that you, you don't care about them and your character is, is, is so flawed that they don't want to follow you anymore. Now, we all know stories about evil people with bad character that have been followed by people. Now, some of that is from a different perspective, you know, from the perspective like the enemy. The enemy's got to be evil, so they're bad. But nonetheless, there are people, you know, there's gangsters and other folks who lead people, but their character is horrible. Trust is part of character. The values that you have are crucial. If you can't build trust, 
you cannot get things to happen fast. Business, your personal relationships, particularly war, moves at the speed of trust. And if your trust is zero, then you have all sorts of problems. Now, fear can make you do things fast, but trust is totally different. If you trust someone and you know they've got your back and you know what they stand for, and you know their character is good and they won't let you down, you'll do anything for that person. And that's the kind of leadership that Eisenhower had. That so people- let's, let's ex- I'm going to jump in. Let's explore where that comes from because I'm trying to connect this to the show as we did because when Peter Caddick Adams was on talking about Monty and Rummel, we talked about how important their experience in the First World War was in terms right. of just all sorts of things, not just the, the tactical, strategic aspect, but just – seeing the effects of war, just that that understanding of the, of the commitment of forces in combat and how it can get. Um, we talked about Rokosovsky and his, his you know, incarceration. You just said by Stalin, he was in the, in the prison, steel teeth, all that torture. Um, how, how does Eisenhower develop these skills? Um, was it something at an early age? I mean, I, I, was, I was always told, uh, well, I was always told, I was told once by um, General Van Fleet's granddaughter, I think I said this through an email, that he learned it all at West Point. Because do you think, do you think, I mean, I know you have, you know, West Point is an important, obviously important part of his journey, but do you think that lack of having any involvement in First World War hindered him or helped him, given the unique role he had? Because this isn't going to be a, a show where we particularly discuss, we may discuss the broad front strategy later on, but it's more about his management of people than it is his ability on the map room floor, if so to speak. So do you think the First World War aspect hindered or helped? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And it's multifaceted. Uh, you know, where did, where did his leadership come from? Uh, did, what, did he, what happened? What did he gain at West Point? And then, you know, did not going to World War I harm him uh, in the sense of not developing his leadership? Well, you know, Eisenhower first came from a family that gave him good character. So if you look at character, competency, and commitment, he had good character. His, his character was part of his raising as in a family, and then it was reinforced in high school, and he played football and baseball. He was really good at baseball, but he loved football. He was better at football. He loved football. And the thing about football and any other team sport that uh, is so important is that you've got to get along with people, and you've got to inspire them and lead by example in order to get things done. Otherwise, they're going to see through you, and they're going to say, this guy can't do it. He doesn't play well. He doesn't play well with others. I don't want him on my team. So Eisenhower was very good at being able to do that. And he learned that from his family and also from playing sports. Sports were crucial. As uh, the Duke of Wellington once said, you know, the, the playing fields of Eton is where we train our leaders. That kind, The idea is that you can learn a lot by working with other people. Think about that. You want to be a leader? Work with other people. What a great laboratory. I mean, don't sit in a cave by yourself. Mm-hmm. So Eisenhower had that background. Then he goes to West Point. Now, I'm a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point as well. And I'll tell you, West Point is the finest uh, leadership school in the world. While you're there, you're thinking, gosh, I can't wait to get into the regular army. I, you know, this is all Mickey Mouse. And you don't realize that what they're teaching you is amazing. And they taught you every single minute. I mean, from the first time that I arrived at West Point, the first minute until I graduated, Everything was leadership by example. Everything was, was had a purpose. Everything was set for a reason. So it's one of the best, greatest leadership schools in the country. Now there's others, Sandhurst and, you know, St. Cyr. And, and, and uh, of course, you've got the Naval Academy and other things. These are all great places. But I experienced West Point, so I know a little bit about what Eisenhower went through. Yeah, of course. Yes, it was different. He went in 1915. I wasn't with him in 1915. Okay. I graduated in 1977. So you know, there's a bit of a difference there. But nonetheless, the school has pretty much kept the same kind of ethos. And so character, competence, and commitment. So his character was very high. His competency grew as he learned more in life. That, that happens with all of us. You start out young and incompetent, <laughs> but you, if you have a willingness to learn, you can overcome these things. So you start to learn. But his competency with people started as an early age. And part of that was heavily influenced by his upbringing at home and his sports playing and his sports playing at West Point. And then later on when he would coach football teams on his spare time because he loved the sport. And then commitment. His commitment to the nation, his commitment to the Army was off the charts. 
I mean, the guy believed in America. He believed in, in, in the army and he believed in freedom. He believed in what he was fighting for. If you don't believe in what you're, what you're doing, if you, if you don't have commitment, you can't go anywhere. So if you can imagine three things, those three C's, you know, the, the idea that you have to have character, character, you have to have competencies and you have to have commitment. If any one of those is higher than the other, that can propel you pretty far. I mean, you don't have to have a lot of competency when you're young if your commitment's high and your character's high because people will understand you and you'll be able to lead and you can do that. But if your character is rotten and your commitment's zero, you can be as competent as you want and it won't last very long. You'll be, you'll be making it by yourself. You, you might be able to find yourself a starving artist, but you've got to have, you know, courage. You've got to have commitment. You've got to have, you've got to have uh, the uh, character and character consists of all the values that you can think of, you know, the, the courage, the trust, all those things that you develop. C uh, competencies means being good at your job. Eisenhower would not have succeeded had he not been a smart planner, good with people and understood the warfare at the time. And he was, uh, again, on the forefront of armored warfare. He understood uh, with George Patton the importance of mechanization. He understood how to put all this together in, in a plan. And again, and no one had ever done quite what they had done before. Yes, Alexander the Great had moved great armies. Napoleon had moved great armies. All those things are true. But no one had gone through the mechanization that, that he had gone through. It was, it was new. And we had aircraft and we had, we had more domains of warfare. You know, prior to World War I, there were only two domains, roughly. There was the domain of land and the domain of sea. And you mastered those to win. And if you could master both, you were amazing. You know, most people just mastered one. Well, in World War II, there were three. There was the mastery of the land, the mastery of the sea, and the mastery of the air. And you could also add to that the mastery of the electronic sphere, which was just beginning. But very important because... You'll see it, yes, you know, in D-Day that, that Eisenhower used deception and radio messages and all these other things to deceive the Germans. So that was icing on the cake. Today in warfare, we say there are five domains. We say there is land, sea, air, cyber, and space. Of course, there was no space in World War II. They didn't have any, any ability to really launch satellites or anything. That didn't happen. And cyber, of course, didn't exist. So they had three domains, but he had to work through all those new things and he did it very well. And he did it because he was a competent study. He, he studied his art and then he had the commitment that was there. But we, but we could identify other people in World War II who have mastered air warfare yes. or have mastered. And we can identify other people who've come out of West Point, who've been that, who still yes. don't, who've fallen short of what Eisenhower had. I mean, I'm not, I please don't think I'm knocking West Point, but West Point has produced thousands of officers, but only every now and then do you get an Eisenhower. I mean, it doesn't mean the others aren't, aren't, aren't <laughs> perfectly good at what they do, but Eisenhower's ability has to come from a, a, a multiple places. West Point, huge part of the puzzle. That's, yeah, let's put that in character as a youth and keeping up to date with um with modern technology so these are these are three elements but there's some of it i'm thinking just must be a natural ability to get on with people where as we come later in and we talk about we've, we've talked about the other shows the, the the characters he's dealing with i mean the middle of the 20th century had some of the history's most extraordinary characters both good and bad you know and de gaulle churchill george the sixth FDR, Patton, Bradley, Montgomery. I mean, the list goes on of people who any one of them would go in a room and just captivate people and people would hate them and some people would love them. He's meeting and, and having to work with all of these people. And I, I, as much as the West Point aspect and the character is part of that, there has to be some other core inner Eisenhower that is giving him the ability to inspire as you said there he's not a compelling leader he's a he's an inspirational leader what is it that is able enabling him to have these people listen to what he has to say well that's that's exactly right i mean the idea that there's no cookie cutter approach to leadership there's no one place you can go and you're now stamped the perfect leader in fact you never arrive it's constantly a journey because everything changes all the time what i was trying to explain was that if you had those three levers you know you have character, you have competency, and you have commitment. And then you go to a, uh, you go to a, a, a position of leadership. You are up, consider each one of those levers. 
you know, what they go up a little bit, they go down a little bit, depending on where you are in each new job. Every one of these leaders, De Gaulle, Mo uh, Montgomery, others, they all had different levels of competency. You know, Mon Montgomery's competency was probably the highest amongst most generals for the military art itself in his thinking of methodical warfare and how he fought. Can, can we have well, that on the record, an American saying something nice about Montgomery? Can I can I make sure we can record absolutely. that? Absolutely. Montgomery was the best general the British had. I mean, he was he was very good at what he did, and he was necessary and, and vital. He was an, almost an indispensable leader in some cases, and um, uh, but that doesn't mean he was easy to get along with. Uh, de Gaulle was also uh, incredibly uh, competent. I mean, um, you know, he fought uh, against the, the Germans in 1940, and, and when others didn't, and and uh, and he was competent in being able to put together a coalition, politically competent. So you know, you couldn't throw that away. So my point is, is to consider those three things I talked about, like levers that go up and down with each yeah. individual. So each person has these at different levels. Now, sometimes you find a group that the right fit is there, or sometimes they have to change a little bit. Eisenhower was, a, was able to adapt. One of his greatest strengths was his ability to adapt those levers as he needed. If he needed to show more competency, he would study it and figure it out. If he needed to show more commitment, he would, he would, he would, he would generate that even though he was highly committed. A character, you know, he would his character was was displayed for everyone to see. So, uh, the thing that 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 uh, that West Point did for him was was give him an opportunity. You see, uh, no matter what school you go to, it doesn't matter. It matters how you use the tools that you're given. So, if you go to West Point and you maximize the experience, you learn as much about being a leader and learn as much about yourself as you can. And West Point teaches you about who you are because it puts you through a crucible every day. So if you learn who you are and you know that you can do things and you have confidence and you move out with these skills because you've taken advantage of them, then you can be at a higher level than some other folks. But that's just the beginning. That's mm. that's the second lieutenant level. I mean, from there, you've got to grow. And what happened with Eisenhower is that he grew. His character was such that he wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't run around chasing women all the time. Okay, we had some girlfriends and stuff. We'll talk about that some of the time. But you know, the point is, is that he wasn't considered a, a, a person of bad character, you know, and I'm not condoning any, 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 you know, he's not a saint, but I'm not condoning any, anything that happened. I'm just saying that when you look at his character, his character was very high. Everyone who, who knew him personally was, was proud to be associated with him because of his character. Even Montgomery says things like, I can't believe that, um, you know, uh, that, that we're so lucky to have Eisenhower here. I mean, there's, there's situations where, even those who who completely railed against his some of his decisions realized he was indispensable for his his his, his particular situation. Now, one of the things that's that's crucial to understand is that most of us lead small teams, or maybe even companies or larger groups, but we lead in a certain way in a sort of a hierarchy. You know, we're used to a hierarchy. Now. It's the toughest, one of the toughest leadership positions in the world is to lead volunteers who you don't hire and fire, okay, because they can tell you to go away rather than listen to you. So you have to be impelling. You can't say, do this or I'll fire you. Some people think that's leadership. So hierarchies are important, and a military has a hierarchy. A commander is in charge. But you see, there's a higher level of leadership that Eisenhower possessed, which made him indispensable. And that's his ability to understand the level of leadership that I call unity of effort. You see, you can order people to do things. And when they work for you, that's relatively simple. And you could say everybody worked for Eisenhower. But did they really? For instance, Montgomery may have worked for him under the under the org chart. But... Montgomery was a national hero, the victor of LMA. He had to be very careful how he treated Montgomery, and he got along with Montgomery fairly well. Um, de Gaulle, he really didn't have de Gaulle in his org chart. But if he didn't get de Gaulle to work with him, there would be bad problems. I mean, if de Gaulle worked against him, that would be a problem. So he had to work on a way to get, to get de Gaulle to work with him. Churchill, Churchill was not in his org chart. It, no way. <laughs> but if but if if Eisenhower didn't work closely with Churchill, nothing would have worked. 
Eisenhower and Churchill had to respect each other. They had to be able to talk with each other, and they had to be able to disagree and still get along. And, and Eisenhower was excellent at that relationship. A good example that is famous, as, as everyone probably knows, is when uh, Churchill, who I admired to, uh, as one of my great heroes in life, he, um, he goes to Eisenhower and he says, OK, well, I'm coming with you on the invasion. I'm going to be on one of his majesty's ships. And Eisenhower says, I really hope you don't do that because that would really increase my burden. I really don't want you to do that. You can't go, <laughs> you know, and uh, they have this little talk. And um, of course, we only hear about it afterwards from both of them. So it was probably nicer in the retelling. Uh, and then uh, uh, Churchill says, well, you know, um, it doesn't matter what you say because you don't control the uh, personnel on ships and I am in the Navy and I can get on the ship. And Eisenhower says, well, it would really add to my burden. I hope you don't do that. And they, they, brought, they, they ended uh, the conversation and, and went their ways. Well, for whatever reason, the word got out to the king. And the king says, well, this is silly for, 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 for Churchill to be going on the invasion. It's too risky, which is what Eisenhower said. And it's going to cause problems for Eisenhower. And we don't want to mess with him. He's got enough to think about. So the king goes to um, Churchill and he says, uh, well, I'm glad you're going. I'm going too. <laughs> and then Churchill goes, well, sir, you can't go. Well, if you're going, I'm going. Oh, well, then I guess we're not going. <laughs> so neither of them went. So it was interesting. I don't know if, um, if, uh, if General Eisenhower made a, uh, a phone call that isn't recorded in history that, to the king and said, sir, would you give me a hand here? But whatever happened, it worked perfectly. Eisenhower had to use unity of effort. He couldn't just tell people what to do. He had to, want, they, he had to have them want to do what he needed them to do. And he did that through unity of effort. Unity of effort is simply this, being able to lead people and influence them when you don't have authority over them. You have responsibility mm -hmm. and great responsibility for something, but you don't have the authority to tell people what to do. Now, all of us find ourselves in that situation. If you're in a business and you have a department, you're responsible for your department and you can tell people in your department what to do. But if you don't work with other departments, you may not get your supplies. You may not get scheduled right. You might not get IT support. So you've got to somehow influence those people and unity of effort is what you have to use to do that. And if you're the CEO of the company or the general in chief, who do you promote? Do you promote the guy who's really good at his job, but, 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 but you know, pisses everybody else off? Or do you promote the guy who not only gets his job done or her job done, but is able to help the whole organization and work with everybody in the whole organization? That's unity of effort. That's a higher level of leadership, and it's rare. And that's why Eisenhower was so special and one of the reasons that he makes such a great president. And, th and this is where I'm going to kind of bring up my he didn't learn that at West Point. Because, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, there isn't a class at West Point about how to work with presidents and prime ministers and kings. I mean, I'm assuming that class doesn't exist. No, that class so, exists nowhere. But I'll tell you what, unity of effort is something you learn, you can learn anywhere. And I bet you he learned it at West Point. As, okay. much, as much as he learned it anywhere else. Because you have to influence people to get things done who you cannot order. You know, you don't have the power and the authority to make them do it. You have to get you have to want them to do it. Now, that's influence. That's leadership. But it, in an organizational framework, when you start talking about big organizations like Eisenhower, you know, in, in, in charge of Supreme Allied Headquarters, he has got to work with a lot of folks and get them to do stuff in ways that are just harder than most of us ever could understand. And the complexity involved in creating just, for instance, the D-Day operation is immense. When you look back at the planning for D-Day, what amazes me is how many times I see, and I, I look for this, so I, it pops out to me all the time, an analog computer somewhere. Now, I'm not talking about a box with electricity. I'm talking about a big board with a whole bunch of lines and a whole mm -hmm. bunch of magnets or a whole bunch of check marks or the big board like, you know, you saw in the Battle of Britain when they moved their sticks and you know, things on the ground. There are all these ways that these guys thought through these problems. Imagine... Just imagine the simple problem of clearing the minefields before D-Day and getting the ships through those minefields, those mine lanes in the water. I'm not even talking getting to the shore. And the Navy had to do all that. And they had this tremendous board 
that had where everything was and how they went through it and the, and the sequence of how things go. And you can see these in some of the places, some of the museums in, in both France and, and the United States and, of course, definitely in uh, in Europe. So the, com the, the character, the competency, and the commitment of these guys was very important. Eisenhower had a level of leadership that was that was excellent and then even more so because he understood unity of effort and he was able to be humble enough to make it happen because there were so many times in his private memoirs and stuff that he says, I wanted to choke him, but I didn't. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of conversations going on the sidebar. David O'Keefe, the well-known Canadian historian, is jumping in a lot, as he always does, saying in some ways it's the key is down to who recognized this talent in him and, and put him in that position to be in that in that role, which is worth pointing out. I mean, you, I want to, I'm my brain goes in different directions because that's how I work. But you talked about the planning of D-Day. Now let's, you mentioned De Gaulle and I know I'm kind of, when De Gaulle was shown the, the D-Day plans by Eisenhower, and it was a kind of a fraught moment. You must, you've talked about it, you've written about it. And, um, and De Gaulle instantly kind of wanted to, to make some changes and started going up the map and saying, no, do this, do that. And the plan was done. Now, in the, the, the same thing had actually happened to Eisenhower, because Eisenhower never planned D-Day. He assumed command of the operation that was already pretty much sorted out. Now, he could have come in and said, right, I'm the supreme commander, guys. We're changing it all completely. I want to start it all from scratch. He didn't, did he? He, 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 he basically took that plan on. He, he put some influence in it. He, he, he brought staff in, but he didn't change it. So he he doesn't appear to me to have any kind of ego of the need to demonstrate his offer. This, this strange authority he's got that means he's actually, as I said in the top of the show, he's superior to the president and the king and the, and the prime minister. But he doesn't feel this need to kind of stamp and put his foot down and, and use that responsibility. How, how does, where does that come from? Where does that ability to kind of be both restrained and firm at the same time? Well, that's the key to being the kind of exceptional leader that Eisenhower was. And that came from his lifelong development as a leader. You see, as I said, leadership's a journey. So, you know, you start off, if you got commitment and you got character, you can learn the competencies. And he started to, ru to rise up that, that level. And he understood those three, those three aspects of leadership. And he knew when he was dealing with a leader that had bad character, that there were challenges there. And he knew how not to select that kind of guy for certain jobs. And then he knew people that were incompetent, and of course you don't you don't want to follow an incompetent leader. And then and there were there were many, and you could we could talk about incompetent leaders in World War II as as a totally different uh, yeah. you know show. It's like a negative show, but yeah, we could yeah, do it. Well, <laughs> yeah. I like it the other way around too. But then you talk about you know the 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 commitment level, and that and that's so important because you know he was totally committed to the success of the operation, and he had been involved intricately with the development of the D-Day plan since actually 1942 he knew that not not the plan that actually happened but the whole concept of invading europe i mean the ally the americans were were very much into uh let's go for it and let's get into france and let's take them and of course they had differing uh, you know views with the with the british and uh, and the canadians who wanted to go a little bit uh you know a uh, different approach a little more indirect and both approaches make a lot of sense and that's a that's a strategy discussion and he lived through that, and that's why he went to Africa, and that's why they went to Sicily, and that's why they went to Italy. And, of course, learned along the way all about how to do that. Putting together an amphibious operation in World War II was a complete, was an extremely complex thing, as we, as we mentioned earlier, just with the lines. So being able to do all that was crucial. And his, his ability to learn as he did that, I mean, he grew dramatically from 1940. Well, from 1940, he was a lieutenant colonel. You know, yeah. by, by 1944, you know, I mean, he's, he, there he is, general in charge of the biggest operation in history. So this guy has an amazing trajectory. But the years that he spent in the Army from uh, West Point all the way through and all the leaders that he worked with and all of the stuff that, that, that happened with, to him was vital in making him who he was. And even though he didn't go to World War I, he learned a lot. And he never forgot that. He never forgot the fact that, that he hadn't been there. In fact, you know, he always felt a little guilty about not being, you know, in the trenches. But you, the Army asks you to serve, and they don't tell you you're going to serve just for you, you know. I used to tell my lieutenants, all my officers in my battalions and my regiment when I commanded a regiment, is that remember what it, that, that's on your collar. It says U.S. It's about us. 
not about you. It doesn't say I. And that was one of the really wonderful things about uh, uh, Eisenhower. He was very humble. And um, uh, even though he would get angry and, and you know, and of course, he had he he uh, he, he um, uh, was uh, upset when people didn't give him credit and things. But he never made a show of it. And he never talked about it much. He was an extremely humble guy. And um, one of the things that you can do is you can go and watch in the archives um, and you can go on YouTube and find it. Uh, his uh, presentation to uh, the troops uh, after the war in Europe is won. He has yeah. this this short I video. It today. Yeah. yeah, he has this short video and he not one time does he say I. The whole time he's talking is first he says, I want to thank, you know, he says I there. He says, I want to thank these people who did such a great job. And he mentions the senior leaders. And then he says, but the real victory was won by the GI. You know, the, the American, the Canadian, the British, the, you know, the Australian who fought here. And, and he brings it all down to them. It's not about him. See, I mean, see there's a quality yeah. that, for example, Montgomery does not possess. I mean, especially in his writing post-war, where Montgomery is I, 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 and he never shares the credit. Never. It's always, it all worked how I planned it. And you know, even the 90% victory about Arnhem is very I, it's very self centric. It's not, um, and uh, Martin, um, hi again, another wise. He said, I can't find the comment in there, but the, the sidebar is moving really fast now. He said that maybe Eisenhower didn't change the uh, overlaw plan because it didn't need changing, and I would agree that it probably didn't need changing, but I would also suggest that a lesser commander would have felt the need to stamp something on it. And so just even something stupid, like all the pins on this map are blue. I want to make them red just to, just because they have that power. We all know in leadership, whether we're talking about in business, as you say, in the military, the new boss comes in and feels that need to show that they're the new boss and they change something for the sake of it. Eisenhower doesn't seem to, to, to have to feel the need to do that. He's, as you say, this comes from his humility. It comes from his, his awareness that he's only a cog in, in, in the wheel. And I think and David O'Keefe made the point. I can't find it again now. Um, oh, here it is that he's also aware of his limitations and there, and we've, this came up in another comment about how to delegate to people who have the skills that he doesn't perhaps have, because none of us are good at everything. And right. Eisenhower clearly knows how to appoint. And we, we want to bring in the, uh, later on, I definitely talk about Beadle Smith, because I think he's an integral part of Eisenhower's success. And we'll talk about that later. But, you know, again, you know, the, you're going to say you're going to say the, the West Point training is, is a huge part of this. But again, I'm going to make the point that West Point has only ever produced one Eisenhower. Lots and lots of other incredible leaders. But Eisenhower, well, there's something unique there. And, you know, I want to I try and find out if we can tonight put the pin on exactly what that is. But, I mean, you're, 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 you're very professional. You're very slick. Your three qualities there. But there, I feel there's something he has that, that we've got to kind of hone in on. Yeah, well, exactly right. Um, the... Um... The thing that he did was he believed that truck, trust trust was a huge accelerant to operations. You can emphasize your own competence. I'm good. I'm really, I'm really indispensable. I'm the guy you got to have. Uh, you know, I am the state, whatever, you know, you can be Napoleon. Um, but Eisenhower was cut of a different cloth. He was, um, a leader who believed in trust, and he learned about people. He saw their character, their commitment, and their, their competencies, and then he gave trust to them, and he trusted them to get things done. And in almost all cases, his trust was was uh, reciprocated. I mean, there are a few exceptions where a couple of general officers got drunk uh, before D-Day and things like that, but mm -hmm. otherwise than that, he was he was a guy who who um, learned to trust people and not micromanage. Now, it's very difficult to micromanage an organization as large as uh, Eisenhower had to command. And if you do it, you're gonna you're gonna mess things up in many ways. Now, one of the things you said earlier about how the plan didn't change, um, Eisenhower was actually uh, faced with a with a change in plan with the Utah Beach operation. You know, Utah Beach initially was not part of the plan. But uh, he was convinced after talking to uh, General Bradley and others that it needed to be done. So that was a change to the plan. 
but it wasn't something that he forced on because exactly. he it wasn't his off. thing that he, yeah, yeah. exactly right. But the plan did, did adapt. So what he knows, what, what Eisenhower did as far as the decision-making was he understood that you have to adapt, that you don't, that you fit the, the plan to the circumstances. You don't try to make a plan work after the circumstances have changed and you're now just doing it because you have to, because everyone has a plan. I mean, I have been on situations in, in operations where uh, they said, well, we can't change the plan now. It's all synchronized. If we do, everything will be screwed up. Okay, so we're going to follow a plan that will lead to failure? Now, that's happened before, especially in, in, in war. Um, so he was not like that. He would adapt the plan. He, he knew that that was necessary. Now, at the strategic level, you have to make those changes in the right timing. Otherwise, you just make the whole organization, you know, uh, screwed up. So uh, he was clever in the sense that he understood. He was smart in the sense that he understood the impact of his decisions and at his level, how important it was to make decisions in time. And, of course, the decision for D-Day and deciding when to invade um, after the weather call and all is a great example. And, and as far as trust goes, his trust in the weatherman, think about that. Group Captain Stagg. Yeah. Now, he didn't just see Stagg for the first time when Stagg came to him and said, sir, you can't go on the 5th. The weather's too bad. And then, you know, Eisenhower would have argued with him if he, you know, if, if he didn't trust him. But he had done that for weeks prior to this. He had basically trained Stagg to brief him and he learned to trust him because they would brief a weather. They would brief the weather every morning, uh, early in the morning and for the next day. And then they would check it. And Stag was right, and Stag was right, and Stag was right, and this was something that gained trust between Eisenhower and Stag, and they began to have a relationship. There's an interesting play called uh, Pressure or something that that came yeah. out, uh, which which exaggerates the problem. Uh, I think much greater than it actually occurred. It makes for an interesting play, but I don't think it's it's a accurate history. Uh, Eisenhower and Stagg got along very well. And when you hear Eisenhower talk about Stagg, he has a little smile on his face and says, you know, that guy had a lot of pro had a lot of pressure on him to try to give me the right kind of decisions. And he could have come up to me and said, maybe it will work or maybe it won't. But he gave me his honest opinion every time. And I trusted him. Yeah, I trusted him. And that's what counts. So that accelerated the whole operation. Had he not trusted the weather report, he would have said, no, I don't trust you. Let's go. And we'll do eight hours of more study to see if the weather's going to change. He didn't do that. He trusted Stag. And what's interesting, if you study the uh, the, the weather uh, decision making business on D Day, there were three camps. Stag controlled one that was putting it all together. I mean, one was British and one was American, and the British and the Americans didn't agree. In fact, they both said both camps said that uh, that the weather would be too bad uh, on the um, on the sixth of June. To risk it, and that was because, you know, weathermen don't like to to be proved wrong, and 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 if they say the weather's going to be bad, it's bad, you know. But if you have an invasion and it fails, and you said it was good, that's a lot of responsibility. But Stag was willing to bet his reputation on that and his trust with Eisenhower. That's amazing. That's mm -hmm. an amazing situation. So um, uh, again, I think trust was a cornerstone of Eisenhower's leadership style. And I believe his ability to do unity of effort is what raised him above yeah. all other leaders in uh, the allied cause in Europe. Yeah. So just to tell you where we are in the sidebar, people are wanting us to go into looking at some of his bad leadership qualities. I mean, not bad, but less than perfect. So we can, we'll talk about the broad front strategy. We're not going to go folks into the, you know, the micro analysis of market garden and things like that. That's beyond the scope of this, but I want to, before we go on to that kind of maybe negative aspect, let's look at his ability to build teams, because I think I've always thought that's something very, very important about um, his leadership. Um, and I, you know, you look at, look at those, some of those figures there. And I want to particularly bring Beadle Smith in a minute, but look at, you know, you've got Lee Mallory. Now Lee Mallory, I always say, is the Eeyore of the of the team. You know, he's the slightly <laughs> gloomy. If something's going to go wrong, it yeah. will. He'll point out all the things. And you've got others there who are slightly more chirpy and slightly more optimistic. And I think that's a brilliant ability that he has that perhaps your Hitlers and your Stalins don't have, where you surround yourself with yes men. 
because yeah. Eisenhower has enough responsibility and clout to just have people who say yes to every single thing he says, but he doesn't. Because Lee Mallory will stand up and say, I don't think this, you know, he doesn't do it in a horrible way, but he says, everyone's going to die is, is kind of his, you know, all these paratroopers are going to be dead. And of course, yeah, 70% of 70, all paratroopers yeah, will be killed right. before they're in the ground. And, you know, and, and so he's got to balance those people saying, as you said, the weather, the people going go and the people go don't go. And he yeah. knows to have those both sides, but he also knows how to then draw on his own, whatever you want to call it, hunch, skill, trust, and then go with his gut decision. Because someone said, who has the more stress? Is it um, Stag or is it Eisner? And I would say, well, ultimately it's Eisner because he's the one who has to actually make the call. The responsibility is his. Right. I mean, Eisenhower's decision could could uh, lose the war. And you go, oh, that's that's not true. We'd never lose the war. Well, nothing is nothing is for certain until it's done. And if if we had lost D-Day, um, if the Germans had had another year to develop nuclear weapons, or maybe they used chemical weapons, or who knows what, who knows how things would have gone. All that's counterfactual. So yeah, I think the stress was higher on on Eisenhower. But what's interesting is he did not berate Stag. He didn't stress Stag out more. Yeah. In fact, he made Stag as comfortable as possible so that Stag could 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 give him a clear report. I mean, that's a quality of leadership that's really important. The higher in rank you are, the calmer you must be. I think that's a very good point, John, because, you know, in our other shows on Leadership Week, you know, let's be honest, Stalin doesn't kind of <laughs> motivate that way. If he's angry at you, he'll shout at you and shoot you. Right. And, and yeah. Montgomery perhaps can be a bit snappy and MacArthur can be a bit snappy and Patton can be a bit snappy. As you said right at the beginning of this, you know, Eisenhower knows how to not put the stress on, keep – a stressed person under your command will not be functioning at their best. If they are relaxed, if they are feeling they've got to ha understand the gravitas, they've got to understand the importance of that, but not be able to be incapacitated by fear of getting it wrong. So he's good at that. But I think for the sake of it, we'll come back on some positives. Let's 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 talk about the, the negative aspects, if there are any. And the, you know, before we went online, you came up with a kind of a a suggestion as, 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 a, as a weakness, quote, unquote, which is? Well, I've been thinking about it since then, so there's actually two things I want to bring up. Okay. First, the, the, the weakest part of, of Eisenhower was he was learning on the job. Now, that's true of any almost any leader, but Eisenhower's uh, challenge was to learn fast on the job at different levels of command. I mean, if you think about Africa, Sicily, Italy, and then, you know, D-Day and then the, the entire fight through um, through France to Germany and the end of the war, he's learning as he's going up. So he's constantly moving those levers and learning and getting higher and higher in his competency yeah. level and other areas because he has to. And because of that, there were some mistakes made. Uh, he didn't pay enough attention in Africa, for instance, to when the half tracks were going to be issued to the troops. Half tracks, no kidding, M3 half tracks. So they're in the middle of the fight in Africa and they find out they've got all these half tracks and they're not being deployed because they, they want to make up a secret to the Germans and they're afraid the Germans might use them or something. I and mean, this is the kind of thing that was happening. Um, the same thing could be said of uh, a variable time fuse, which is another story. We had variable time fuse early in, in, uh, in 1944, and we didn't really start using it until Patton said, what the heck's going on here? And Eisenhower agreed with him totally. So you're learning on the job. You don't know everything, and, it's, and there's mistakes made because of that. Uh, initially, some of the mistakes were – were because he couldn't get communications out well enough. One of his big mistakes in Africa was he was too far away from the scene of action initially. So he learned how to adapt to that. So um, if you're if you're looking at Eisenhower at different phases of World War II, different commanders go, well, he made a mistake here, he made a mistake here. Now, there aren't any leaders that don't make mistakes and there aren't any humans that don't make mistakes. Yeah. What counts is that you adapt, you learn from the mistakes, and that you get everyone to come along with you. And the more that you build trust, the easier it is for everyone to do that. And that was his key. He built trust wherever he was. I mean, sometimes he would just, with his smile and his as affable manner, he would make people calm and make them want to listen to him and build up this immediate trust, which, is, which isn't yet verified. But after time, it was easily verified. And yeah. so um, that's what counts. I mean, you can... You can um, uh, look at at the other thing that we talked about the the broad front strategy. You know, uh, a decision. You know, we're looking. We're now talking about decisions, not leadership character, 
competencies or commitment, except for a decision making as part of your, your competencies. So should he have, like Napoleon might have, in 1944, after the, uh, after the defeat of the German armies in France in the Falaise Gap, couldn't he have just um, said, okay, we've got, let's, let's maximize our force and let's drive directly for a key center of gravity, Berlin, whatever, and let's make that happen. And would that not have brought the war to a, to a quicker end? Again, counterfactual uh, um, history. People talk about it forever. The broad front strategy versus the narrow front has been the argument of thousands of debates on countless debates. And uh, the the true answer is is that you can't answer it. You know, the what he did worked. And um, there's so many other things that most people don't think about. You know, there when when you look at decisions, there are kind of three broad categories. You know, there's operational, organizational, and informational. Informational is really important. Who talks to who and what information do they give? Because if they're if you're talk if the wrong people are talking to each other, then the information is not passing to the right people. And if they're passing the wrong information, you know, not the most important information, not the information that's vital to that situation, then it's worthless. So informational is really crucial. And he had to create that whole informational setup because, you know, the the allies hadn't worked together quite like this before. Yes, they'd had Sicily and Italy and in Africa, which was great training. But D-Day and everything else in France, you know, that was that was hard. And then uh, the next thing is, you know, informational is, is uh, organizational. Who works for who and what organization do you set up to do that? He had to set all that up for for the uh, Supreme Allied Command to get into Europe. And 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 of course, he had a lot of help. But but setting up that organization was important because if you just to put it at a tactical level, if you need a machine gun, but you don't have one in your organization, what are you going to do? So you got to have the right organization. And they were bringing in all sorts of new things. I mean, we had tanks, of course, that swam and all this new stuff was being tried. And then, of course, you have the operational decisions. So most people just go immediately to the operational decision. They should have gone left. They should have gone right. You know, they should have gone right up the center. That's the easiest decision in most cases after the fact to look at. Yeah. Because you can see a map and you can do that. And they forget to dig into the organizational informational issues. So... When you start saying, should you have a narrow front or a broad front, well, would that have disrupted the informational and organizational setup? Organizational setup includes supply. I mean, imagine all the, imagine the, the complexity of the supply issues in World War II, um, and we were a well-supplied force. I mean, the Allies were so well-supplied that the Germans were astounded. I mean, there's a, there's a story of a German who was captured on D-Day, and... Um, he um, he's in a POW camp uh, makeshift barbed wire on the beach somewhere, and he's just sitting there waiting to be evacuated. And he sees this American drive a jeep into the water and stops and breaks. They just push it off to the side, and they go in and drive a new one out. Yeah. The Germans said, "You know, <laughs> we never would have done that." You know, I mean, these guys have so much wherewithal that it's incredible. And of course, we have complete air supremacy in most cases. Um, so that made a huge difference. I mean, you know, all the difference in the world. Uh, we were able to. I mean, we were able to do things that that, that the German army was just was I just think, I think outclassed by. Yeah. Your your comment about it coincided exactly with Sheldrake Six talking about the broad versus narrow front is that you're right. you're you're bang on the money there. That's an operational issue, but you're not looking at these other two factors. Yes. Just yeah. okay. You look at the map and say, okay, that arrow there seems to have a clearer gap ahead of it than that arrow there. Maybe that would have worked. But there's this huge, huge structure behind it. You know, I, I referenced you know James Holland and uh, his talk about the freedom of poverty the Germans have, for example, in Normandy because they haven't got strength in depth, so they can have these camp and groups that do these exciting dashing maneuvers. But it, they're losing. They're losing. It, it seems a bit exciting, but they haven't got this tail behind it. and the allies have this massive massive great tail behind it that has been set up to fight a certain way and you can't suddenly just turn an entire organization on its 180 and flip it and do something different with it so the and, and again the broad front narrow front single thrust we're talking about a campaign in the ETO that worked. Okay, could could it have worked quicker? Maybe could it have taken longer? It, it's well, the 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 advantages of ending World War II in Europe sooner would have been dramatic. Maybe millions of people would have survived. So you know, what is that worth? Uh, but being defeated 
and not doing that is also what you have to, to, to weigh it against. So if you try a hell bent for leather cavalry charge to Berlin and it fails and you lose, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of men and they cut off your supplies and they win a great victory, you know, what have you done? You've, you've lost the war or you've at least prolonged the war. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of thought that went into this. I mean, the, the D-Day invasion logistics is a study that I recommend anybody who wants to find out how hard it is to do something big like this. I mean, yeah. just for instance, uh, fuel. You know, they laid a pipeline from England through the channel to France. It's called Pluto, named after the cartoon dog that they, you know, code name. I mean, so this fuel is coming into Normandy by a pipeline. I mean, that's amazing. And, and the mulberries, the, the artificial harbors, you know, those, those are amazing. I mean, uh, the fact that, that the, the Germans operationally said, well, they can only land, they can only land in certain places to take a port. And if they don't get the port, they're, they're, they're finished. But we brought our own ports. So we didn't need a port. I mean, it, it was incredible. Plus, we had just um, unbelievable wherewithal. We had a Navy that was uh, allied Navy that was tremendous. And the work and the energy that went into all that is, you know, so important. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, when you reference the minesweeping, we had Nick Stanley on a few, last week or week before talking about the minesweeping before D-Day, and it was a oh, spellbinding yeah. talk for an hour and a half about just exactly you know, 300 and something plus ships doing that and all the different types. And it's just, just incredible, incredible micro-organization of something that, that various people like King and Bradley and others said was without that foundation in place, Overlord doesn't work. So, yeah, it, it's a very complex thing, and Eisenhower is overseeing all of that. Um, and you know, this, yeah, this, this idea of, of sure the war could have been finished earlier, but at the same time, as you said, we're kind of five years in now, the end is in sight to, to, to lose it at that point, taking it on a 50, you know, if we'd done this dramatic swift thrust, maybe it'd have worked, but as you say, maybe it wouldn't have worked, you know, slow and steady. Well, you know. I don't know if it was so much that he wanted to go slow and steady, but you know, for instance, there are certain things that disrupted the the the, uh, the overall tempo of it. When you look at Market Garden, um, Eisenhower trusted Montgomery to pull that off, and uh, of course, it was a ninety percent success. So, <laughs> so except for if you were the British Airborne. Uh, so, um, uh, if that had worked, I mean, it had that had happened, had that had actually uh, happened, and that was adaptive planning at, at you know. Uh, it, to extreme. Yeah. You see, they had just, they, they pulled that off in almost a week in planning. So um, uh, if that had worked, uh, it would have been an amazing uh, change in, in events. Now, since it didn't work, that put you, that set you back. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to look at the broad front versus a narrow front, there was an opportunity for a narrow front there. Now, maybe not the best location, uh, narrow fronts uh, in, in Holland, you know, and, and the single roads and all that. But nonetheless, you know, if 30 core had gone a little faster and all those things that happened, who knows if, if Market Garden had been a success, but it wasn't. Yeah. So therefore, you know, it reinforced the broad front design because one of the things that the broad front capability did is, uh, is similar to what Napoleon did with his, uh, his um, core system. You know, you, you continue to move along a big front and then when you see when you see opportunities, then you can have a reserve that can you uh, that, that can uh, exploit that. Um, now they used most of their reserve in Market Garden and had to reconstitute, you know, at least the airborne reserve. So um, uh, World War II is has 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 so many great examples of uh, leadership that um, we can learn so much from it. It's such yeah. a rich uh, uh, arena to study because although technology is changing. And it's changing very fast, and warfare, the methods of war are changing very fast. Um, nonetheless, human beings are still the most most critical element of war, and uh, and, and all events, actually, all, all affairs, business, and everything. So the, the quality of your leaders, the ability for those leaders to impel teams to get things done effectively and efficiently, and the ability to build trust and, and understand in larger organizations unity of effort, these are some great lessons we can learn from Eisenhower. Yeah. Um, David O'Keefe is asking you what your opinion is about the fact it was an election year in the USA. How much does that affect the historiography of you know of, of the responsibilities in FDR? Where does that come in, you think, to Eisenhower's decision-making in that summer? 
Oh, that's interesting. I don't think that FDR put any pressure on him at all. Um, you know, there's there's two wars that you can look at uh, as far as, as um, uh, American presidential elections and their effect. One is the American Civil War. Had, um, had Grant not taken Vicksburg and Sherman not taken Atlanta, would Lincoln have been reelected? And if he wasn't, would the would there be two Americas today? Um, you know, that's kind of a crucial question and interesting counterfactual history. But um, they they fought those battles knowing that, that a victory was vital to the election of the president. Um, of course, if 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 uh, D Day had been a defeat, a disastrous defeat, with a lot of Americans and, and British and Canadians and Australians killed, had that had happened, um, then uh, whether or not FDR would have remained president or not is is again counterfactual. But he had such a a um, um, stronghold of the of the uh, political machine and also a a a, a, a strong political uh, patriotic following uh, that there were, there were people who who um, didn't know any other president you know mm. but FDR yeah yeah I mean so it, he was uh, he was quite a phenomenon in American history I don't think that it would have I think we would have stuck by him but I think that um, uh, you know, there had been major changes in the political makeup and, you know, and, and he probably yeah. would not have run for another term, but who knows? Super. Yeah. Let's talk about Beadle Smith. Let's talk about having a solid, dependable right-hand man because every good manager, leader, general, business, CEO, football coach, whatever you want to call it, that has that person behind them or wife or wife has a husband, partner has a partner. Is, is, is Beadle Smith given enough credit? For, for his incredible role there, just well, tell us what he was doing. What what were what did he bring to the table that we should be re, re, reminded of? Well, you're exactly right. Unless you live on an island and you're talking to a soccer ball and there's nobody else there, you in fact are going to have to rely on other people to succeed. Teams win. Individuals are very important, and some individuals can become uh, superstars and heroes, but teams win and those who can leverage teams to win are the people we want and the people that lead us and beetle smith was a good great soldier in his own account but he had earned the trust of eisenhower and he became as you said his right hand man because he was able to do many things that eisenhower didn't have to do uh he could be a gatekeeper he could be a uh, the hammer when uh, eisenhower wanted to, not to be so so hard he could be uh, the the uh, the messenger who uh, brought you the news that hey you know you really uh, shouldn't uh, do that, um, and he was also just an excellent staff officer who could put it all together. You know Eisenhower had the ability to be an excellent staff officer. He'd been a chief of staff for MacArthur and others, and MacArthur said he was one of his better chief of staffs in a, in a kind of a not so not so positive way. Said he was his best clerk he ever knew, but that's because I think uh, MacArthur was a little bit jealous. Um, so I think what you have with, with Beatle Smith is an example of great leaders who bring talent to their side. You know, Bertier for Napoleon, um, yeah. uh, you know, Beatle Smith for, um, for Eisenhower, um, uh, the uh, Sherman and, and, uh, and Grant, and of course, uh, others that were on Grant's staff. Um, there's, uh, you know, it's interesting, the, the generals of World War II Think about the American Civil War the way we think about World War II. Mm. In other words, they're about 70 years apart. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. Um, and so they were reading the latest histories of the American Civil War and learning about learning additional leadership from that from that study, just as we study World War II. So uh, we're now at the, at the 77th year. So, um, you know, we're going to be... Uh, moving along to something new here soon, which is uh, frightening. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But, I mean, uh, but nonetheless, Beatle Smith was crucial, and it shows you how good leaders get people of, of character, competence, and commitment to support them and to um, do so willingly and do so happily and do so in a way that, that makes a team effort. And that, yeah. that ability is what, what Eisenhower brought. And this is a great picture because the look on Eisenhower's face here when he's looking at, at Beale Smith, I think is priceless. 
You know, it, it reminds me of those memes. It says, "Find someone in your life who looks at you like Eisenhower looks at Beatles Smith." It's, <laughs> right, exactly there, right. it? yes. it's, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's reverential. It's respectful. I know it's, it's easy to put too much into a photo, but you yes. know, there is, there is something there, and I think that that is, and also, folks, just in my research today to put the PowerPoint together, how many photos you can find of Eisenhower? making people look comfortable around him you don't see yeah. many photos of montgomery smiling you don't see many photos of Patton smiling and and yeah eisenhower clearly i mean i know again photographic records are not a complete you know you can't judge everything by moments but he did seem to have this ability to just put people at ease and i think the other thing that came up in the in the other leadership shows is the crafting of an image by both the person themselves and by the press around them. So Montgomery yeah. is a combination of his own creation of his own image and the Black Beret and the Royal Tank Regiment and the uh, the kind of uh, Rommel was a bit short, so kind of stood on the top of vehicles to be taller. Rokosovsky had his teeth. It seems to me of the of these celebrity leaders, for want of a better word, Eisenhower is the one who is the closest to actually who he really is. He, what you yeah. see is absolutely what you get with Eisenhower. There isn't some kind of public persona, private persona. He is absolutely um, yeah. the person he is. Would you agree with that? Yeah, he's an American citizen soldier from Abilene, Texas, Abilene, uh, Kansas. Yeah. yeah. Now, he's born in Texas, so I always say Texas, but he's Abilene, Kansas. But, um, you know, and when he goes back, home after VE day uh, and they have this big parade for him in like July 4th or so sometime in the summer of 1940 45 before the war is even over but nonetheless they've won in Europe um, you know it's like coming home this is his how this is mm. his little town this is what he this is where he expected to live of course he didn't do that he went off to be the uh, president of Columbia College and then he became the NATO commander because we suddenly realized we needed NATO when the Russians weren't demobilizing and Cold War started, and then uh, Korean War wouldn't wouldn't end, and and uh, they asked him to be president so that he could end that. And the, shortly after becoming president, he ended the Korean War. Yeah, I mean, leadership is amazing. And then he had eight years of a very successful presidency, which set the United States up for a the greatest boom in, in the economy well, and everything else. It's in, I mean I mean I'm a Brit. You probably noticed. But you say he was a great president, and I'm not in any way disagreeing with you, but that not, wasn't necessarily how he was perceived back in the 60s and 70s in the immediate aftermath. I think I'm absolutely with you now. Yeah, that's true. 20th, 21st century, I think people are realizing it was a really good, solid presidency, but it, that wasn't in the historiography of how we study presidents. It's well, not in a constant up for Eisenhower. Forgetting, I'm talking. I'm talking about his presidency now, not his. I, I know. Well, remember remember terms, who right? Rightly, yeah. he's on the pedestal to never be come off. But in presidency terms, that's a modern view, isn't it? Well, remember, right? remember who writes the histories. Okay, so here's some things. We uh, number one, um, we didn't go to war during that time period, and he ended wars. Number yep. two, we could have gone to nuclear war at any time, and that didn't happen. And um, uh, the entire setup was. Uh, was designed to have limited government and um, and a successful economy. Now, a lot of people think that's a good idea. Um, some big, some want big government and, and telling and, and having government tell you what to do all the time. So if they want that, then they won't like Eisenhower. But don't forget who came right after Eisenhower. You know, mm. Kennedy. And so Camelot, Kennedy, press love Kennedy. So if you if you're going to be the new, the young, the you know the cool guy. The old guy, bald-headed general, that's the last, you know, that's kind of, it was like turning a page. Uh, but isn't isn't the Roosevelt to Kennedy presidency the oldest age gap between two consecutive I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, yeah. 26, 27 years, something. I mean, it doesn't really yeah. matter, but I, th I believe it is the record for the biggest age I, gap I, between I outgoing so. and incoming. But, you know, the, the, the um, um, there was a complete, a mythology with Kennedy that everything was new, everything was different, everything was better, everything was great, everything was the '60s, you know, yeah. and and that's just a strange kind of thing that that people go through. And it was a generational shift. But when you look back at the Eisenhower president, you know, I like Ike. I mean, he was he was a solid leader. <laughs> and it's also, I mean, again, I'm speaking as a Brit. It's also about when you're looking at past presidents. 
you end up making the comparisons to the current or recent ones. And depending on how good or bad your current one is, it makes the past one seem better or worse. And the same equally applies to British prime ministers, by the way. Yes. So, you know, I mean, we, we're coming back to Eisenhower's skills of bringing people together because I'm going down a rabbit hole now of talking about politics. But your country, my country, France, even where I live, split right down the middle. There are no bridge builders anymore. It's extreme left, extreme right, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm right, you're wrong. Eisenhower, going back to all his skills in the wars, would seem to me to be the kind of person, if he had him now, he'd be bringing these sides together and finding that mid-ground and, and, and assembling teams of people from both sides and saying, let's meet in the middle and, uh, and find solutions. But we're kind of going down a a modern no, I think, I think it's a good point because uh, as far as leadership goes, building trust and understanding yeah. unity of effort and remembering that when you lead free people, you don't order yeah. them. You yeah. know, you work for them. Yeah. Eisenhower always knew that he worked for the American people. Yeah. And he did some amazing things, including racial integration and all sorts of other things that the uh, building of the highway system. I mean, he did, a, he did some amazing things, but but I'm not trying to compare him to anyone else. I'm just talking about his leadership. He was a successful yeah. general. He was a successful president. He was a successful leader. Yeah. And uh, we can learn a lot from Eisenhower. So to say Eisenhower is a leader that was in the old days and we can't learn anything from him is as silly as saying we can't learn anything from Alexander the Great or, or from anyone else in, in ancient yeah. history. I, mean, I wanted to bring you, I wanted, one of the things I wanted to bring towards the end of the show, because it's one of my favorite things I bring up on my tours in Normandy is the famous, I hope people are familiar with it, what he would have said the evening of June the 6th had Operation Neptune Overlord been a failure. Um, and there's two things I want to remark about it. And I'll, I'll, I'll just read it for, I cannot give it the Eisenhower swing, uh, you know, accent, but just pretend I'm Eisenhower. Our landings in the Cherbourg half area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Now, the first thing I want to point about that, and I want your reaction, John, is he is completely, in this case, taking the responsibility. Now, those of us who studied Operation Overlord to any level, David O'Keefe, others watching this, know that if it had gone wrong, very little on the day would have been Eisenhower's fault whatsoever. The plan was as sound as a military plan can ever be before an operation. It would have just been come under the, ha happen the heading of shit happens, I suppose. So I think he did take responsibility. I also want to point out the fact, look there in the bottom of the letter, folks, how he says July, July 5th. He didn't put June. Now, there's some debate about whether he wrote that on the evening of June the 5th or the morning of June the 6th, and I'm not going to get down into that particular argument. What I do want to point about is, is how clearly stressed he is at this point that he's confused by what month he is. And, you know, but so there are two things there. The fact that he's taken the responsibility, and the second, we ought to remind ourselves, talking about how brilliant he is, that he was a human being. How much must that pressure and and responsibility have weighed on him over those few hours of around June 4th, 5th, 6th. I mean, that that is a testament to his char character that, the, that he assumed all of that responsibility and actually survived it. No, exactly right. And that was his character, though. You see, he didn't believe in, in assessing blame to other people. Yeah. Now, if somebody, if someone, you know, had done anything criminal and or they had to be relieved, you know, he was willing to do matter. what yeah. was necessary. Yes. That's not what I'm saying. What, but what he did, what he did was he accepted responsibility. I mean, he realized that if this plan failed, and it could have failed in so many ways, it could have failed in so many ways. If it failed, because it was so complex, if it failed, that he would be blamed anyway. So he just said, look, I, I'm responsible. I'm the supreme allied commander. I'm not going to say it was the king's fault or that America didn't support me enough or whatever. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it as it is and accept responsibility as a man would. And what's interesting, it's a very, um, um, it's about being uh, a, uh, a human being who uh, realizes that the courage, the the uh, uh, the responsibility you show, the leadership example that you give, everyone is watching. So he knew part of this that's going through his mind, I believe, is that um, you know, imagine if this had failed. 
we're not giving up the war. We're not going to surrender. It may take another year to get an invasion going, maybe two, but we're going to have to do this again. So I have to set an example for everyone else. And yeah. um, I mean, obviously, you couldn't start relieving everyone down the chain of command just because, because uh, you've got so much invested in all these people uh, that unless they're uh, proven to be uh, not competent uh, or, or lack the character or don't have the commitment, um, you know, you need to to grow them and train them. And so this was also part of his belief in trust being the lubricant of lead leadership, you know, trust overcoming the friction of all operation. You know, if um, if uh, you trust me, then I take responsibility. And if I take responsibility and we win, well, then I thank you. And I tell us that was the team's, team's uh, job, yeah. that, you know, team's effort that won. But if we fail... I feel well that came up in one of the earlier shows about leadership and I forget which one of our viewers said it and I forget who they were quoting now, but they were, and I'm paraphrasing what was said, but someone said that, you know, if, if, if you succeed, everybody shares that, but if you fail, it's very lonely to, to take that responsibility. Well, on. Leaders and, do that. Yeah. And he, and he, and we can all think without having to name them of other figures from world war two, who would have put the blame somewhere else that have shifted it sideways, blamed something else, blame. And in, and in modern life, you know, that, that thing we have, and I'm not going to get into modern, you know, the modern world of everybody's something else's fault, isn't it? I wasn't, you know, and people just don't apologize anymore. People don't just say, sorry, I'm wrong. They will just say, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry you feel that way. Not, yeah. I'm sorry. I, sorry. I hate that. Just come out and say, I fucked up you yeah. know, and well, move on. I believe, I believe good leaders do even to this day. We have a lot of good leaders, you know, in, in the world. We have a lot of good leaders, you know, in, in both our countries and, and other places. And particularly, you know, I work with our military all the time. And we have some great leaders there, both uh, all allies, because I've, I've been to, you know, Afghanistan and places like that. And I've, you know, I've talked with all these folks and we're That's just the blessed to have some good leaders. But but uh, there are many, as you recognize, uh, and this often happens in business uh, more so than, than other places, but it's, 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 it's everywhere because it's human nature, uh, that they blame everyone else, particularly when there's, uh, you know, a lot of money involved and they go, oh, it's not my fault, it's his fault, it's her fault, yeah. you know, and um, – because if they accept fault, then they have to pay for it, you know. But that's what that's what responsibility is all about. I mean, think about what Eisenhower would have had to pay if he had if, if D Day had failed and he just accepted all that responsibility. He would have been hated. I mean, he would have have lost thousands of lives for no no benefit. You can't have a worse situation. Yeah, and and, that, and the irony would be would have been that if he had been the scapegoat and if he had been had to force to resign or boot it out, whatever would have happened we actually would have been getting rid of the one one person who would be able to best bounce back from that and actually yes. mount a second. I mean, we're not going to go down the whole discussion of what would have happened if they had failed or whether it was possible to fail. It's just it's too big a too big a subject to go into, and it's ultimately counterfactual and pointless anyway. But the point is, we're talking about eisenhower's qualities and what he what he set him apart and i think if we were learn a couple of things i think sure sure great character upbringing west point is part of it i also think there's a little bit of kind of lightning only strikes once and he was a unique individual it's that it's that kind of elvis presley you know um those what those people that come along once a lifetime who are just the right person at the right time for for reasons and where they come from and why they come i don't know but you know you you when you referenced that meteoric rise up through 40 what 40 41 40, he was able to see some people like macarthur and others and see what they're doing well see what they're doing not so yeah. well yeah. take yeah. on that so there's a bit of luck in where he ended up as well a bit of timing but somehow it all came together so you know someone asked earlier when i have to scroll back to find it someone said what give us three examples? It can be five, it could be two of 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 things Eisenhower came out of World War II believing as leadership principles, and I mean his things, not necessarily your your three <coughs> your three assessments. But three three things he would have identified. Did he ever really talk about it? I I have read Crusade in Europe, and he did. He doesn't really talk about himself much, does he? No, but 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 he does have some interesting quotes which tell you about his individual leadership. One of them is you don't lead people by beating, beating them on the head. And yeah. what he meant by that was is that you have to impel versus compel. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is is that he he has several quotes that deal with don't micromanage. 
you know, build trust in a team and don't micromanage because that was his leadership style. And then when it comes to making decisions, I recommend everyone check out the Eisenhower decision box. If you've never heard of it, all you have to do is go online. And um, it's a really interesting uh, setup. Um, what happens is, is that um, he said, uh, now I, didn't, I don't mean that he used this for D-Day, but this is something that he used later on as a president. And it may have been the way that, that he thought about uh, uh, doing things uh, all his whole life and just never articulated it. But uh, the, um, uh, the idea that you can make a decision um, and that not all things are the most important things to make a decision of. So if you imagine a quadrant, in the upper left portion of the quadrant, you have things that you manage that are urgent and important. And then below that, you have a void. You know, you have things that are urgent but not important. And then on the right, you have, of the, that, you have not urgent and not important. So limit that. And then at the top, you have not urgent but important, and that's what you need to focus on so that you can get the right things done. And his ability to focus is one of the key aspects of his decision-making ability and his ability to lead. So when he talked with you, he focused totally on you. Yeah. You see, he didn't look at his smartphone. Oh, yeah, they didn't have those. But you know what I'm saying? You've had, I've, I've had CEOs that sit back and look at their smartphone. I'm listening, John. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I'm listening. I'm listening. You're not listening. There's no such thing as multitasking. There's only focus. Multitasking is a lie. You can only do one thing at a time well, okay? You can do several things at a time badly. Don't text and drive because one of those bad things will get you killed. Yeah. All right? So focus is what counts. Now, some people are able to focus quickly and then shift, but everyone who studied the brain says that the shift difference is still a difference. So you can only focus on one thing, and when you focus on the next, you have a period of unfocus until you refocus, and that takes energy and time, and you can't do it all. He would focus on the person. He would focus on the soldier. He would listen to them and talk with them. When he goes to Greenham Common, which is this picture, he's talking to, right there, the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, okay? And these guys, he's talking there to a Pathfinder, but he's talking to the group as the 502nd, and... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole was the uh, the commander of this unit, and he had served with Cole in the 15th Infantry, uh, so they knew each other. But he didn't. I don't know if that was the reason he went there. I think he went there just because it was it was the one of the closest ones. He couldn't yeah, go it was kind of close to where he was, wasn't it? But yeah, just couldn't go everywhere. everywhere. But this was so important. He go. He went there thinking, I got to talk to these guys because you know we're going to lose so many of them. Maybe I can make them feel good. And he got there, and they bucked him up. They made him feel good. He got there, and they said, Sir, we got this. Don't worry about us. You know, we're going to we're going to win. I mean, they were they were unbelievably eager and ready to go. Now, they're all volunteers. They're all the best we have. You know, this is the greatest generation. They're getting ready to go. They're keyed up. But they made him they boot. They, they made his morale soar. And that's and the that interesting thing, because, you know, he, he does. He made eye contact with them individually. Yes. He spoke. Yes. Him. And this is one of the things I, I did some little in my prep for this, because I don't just I do do some work on these. When you look at quotes about people, for example, hearing Montgomery speak in, in the 8th Army in the desert. And I, they would say, Montgomery came and spoke to us. It was brilliant. Okay? Or <laughs> Rommel. Rommel spoke to us. It was amazing. Yeah. When people talk about meeting Eisenhower, they say he spoke to me. Right. And, it, and even, weirdly, hundreds of paratroopers who were there, who he can't even have spoken to physically, individually, yeah. still somehow managed to construct the memory that he spoke to them individually. And that's, I mean, some of them, like Wally Strobel in the photo that he did speak yes. to, Colonel, you know, Colonel Cole, uh, uh, Cole uh, yeah, we spoke to individually. But the others who were there, he's, he managed to somehow convey a humility and character that they thought they'd spoken to him personal. Now, that if that doesn't seal the deal about what kind of a guy he was, then nothing will. These people came out of the war and years later told their grandkids, yeah. He came to Green and Common and spoken to spoke to me. Yeah, and no, you look at the, again, folks. Go on Google. Look at the photos. Look at every time he's with someone. Direct eye contact. Straight yeah. in the eyes. When he was when it was when he was having to give people bad. Unless he gave it to Beadle Smith. You know things like Pat and this that, and the other. When he kind of delegates that, he's doing it there 
person to person in the face boom there you are this is what and and you know we, we, i want to ask you to fi finish with what you think of the tom Selleck movie uh countdown to d-day because it's come up a lot in the conversation tonight and in the movie tom Selleck as eisenhower you uh, they 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 have this pause in the car before he goes out and speaks to the paratroopers about how am i going to do it how am i going to go out and confront hey men who might well be dead within 12 hours and me speaking to them. I don't know whether there was in reality any genuine sitting in the car moment of reflection. I don't know. It doesn't matter for the film because it constructs a moment that conveys exactly what he probably was going through. But um, yeah, yeah. So what was, but, but, so first question, what do you think of that movie? First of all, the first time I heard this movie was coming out and that Tom Selleck was going to play um, Eisenhower, I went, how's that going to work? Yeah. And then I watched it, and within the first 30 seconds, he was Eisenhower. I mean, well, see, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you, John, a little bit. And I, I had to I had to spend about half an hour getting rid of Magnum out of my head. I just, <laughs> it was the second viewing, really, is where I got it. And now, interesting, when I recommend it to people who are younger than me, who've never seen Magnum, right. it, they, it works much better for them. Yeah. Right. Because they don't have that. I just kept wanting him to get in the helicopter and go and fly around. <laughs> yeah. So that was my own personal problem. But well, I told you I had the same issue, but I got over it very quickly because first of all, he's such a great actor that it worked. Secondly, he he uh, I think he captured Eisenhower as best I could I understand from all, everything that I've read. I mean, I, yeah. I I just I just think he was wonderful. I use that movie as a leadership training film. Well, then yeah, that 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 sealed the deal. Yeah. You must you must like it. I like it very um, much. So the last thing I want to touch on, because we've been at it an hour and a half now, it's time has flown, is, is and I think it's a very, very good way to end the show, is Southern Gentleman is asking about how did Ike process the emotions of the loss of troops? Because that's something we haven't really touched on Leadership Week, because he is ultimately in command of all these guys. He is seeing these bits of paper going across his desk saying the US 9th Division has lost this, the 29th has lost that. How did he deal with that? Because he has to balance losing troops with victory there is a there is a loss rate that is acceptable to yeah. get the battle won but do we know how he was able to manage that aspect of it because we know certain commanders seem to not be as well good at dealing with that as others i think particularly about maxwell taylor of the 101st who seemed as the war go on need to be further and further away from the front because he seemed from my understanding to to react very badly to seeing ambulances and meat wagons coming back and right. he's great in the cuban missile crisis when it's moving moving blocks on maps but less good when you're seeing it yourself so how did eisenhower deal with that well that's a great question he dealt with it as a very good human being would one that you would be proud of um yes he got emotional at times uh, later on, as as uh, as president, uh, he was asked a couple of uh, times, and, and and he actually at, at different rallies, and he broke out in tears. Um, General I General uh, Ulysses S. Grant did the same thing once or twice, and that was rare. Um, you know, the, the the idea that leaders must be composed at all times in order to give orders properly and in order to set the right example is very important. You know, I've been in situations where I've seen people dead, and uh, mangled and badly uh, hurt, and um, and, and you have to still lead, but it, it takes a toll on you. And uh, he knew the great responsibility he had. Um, and he had it in such an overwhelming uh, uh, level that none of us can really fathom it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, when you think about, I mean, he went out, when he went out to Greenham Common to talk to those paratroopers, if, you know, seven out of 10 were gonna be dead within the next few hours, he was sending those those young lads off to execution, and yeah. some of them were. Yeah. Some of them, of course, were not as many as had been thought of, but you know, thought that might die. But but then, luckily, so. But um, but he had to face that, and he had to be strong for them, you know, and he had to um, uh, give them courage. So it was a, it's a symbiotic thing, um, you know. The one of the ways you can look at this is is a bit philosophical, but you know, we all die. When you think about all the time you have that existed before you were born in the history of the universe and all the time that will exist after you're gone, that brief shining moment that you have, that's crucial. Using it well, well, that's what Eisenhower did. So we can learn a lesson from Ike about life and about leadership that I think is worthy. 
Um, that is just an absolute perfect way to end the show. You're, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's, it's been an interesting way to finish leadership week because, you know, everybody watching, there's been nothing really negative about Eisenhower at all in the comic. You can imagine what the Montgomery and Rommel show was like. You can imagine what the Patton show was like, you know, yes. there, there were both sides of the argument and people in between. This has been very reverential. Yes. I know we could, there's been some conversations about broad front market garden, the, the, but really if you're, if, there's nothing but praise any of us can 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 give to Eisenhower. He was just absolutely the right person for the job. Yeah. I think every military historian I've ever met of every nation has huge amount of respect for him. And everybody who served under him had a huge respect for him. And and I think that's just the perfect way to end this show with what an what an amazing human being he was. And he is he's inspirational as well as being someone we can study. There are other generals who I like to study them, but I don't necessarily see them as inspirational. Uh, right, no right, names. Exactly uh, right. But, yeah. you know, Monty. Exactly, exactly right. Now, if you think about his his uh, his character, his commitment, and his competencies, his character, his competencies, yeah. and his commitment, and if you think about those as high but almost equal, you get a kind of a well-rounded leader. Imagine a leader that maybe you know we say let's let's say this other guy who could be French leader we won't mention his name who might have commitment way off the chart might not be as high in competency and character might be a little bit less hard to deal with that guy so it's an interesting way of looking at at uh, at individuals and people and we're all different but Eisenhower gives us some wonderful lessons to learn that we all can improve our leadership for we're never going to lead armies in World War II like he did but we can learn to focus to have trust to do the kind of things that he did, to have the character, the, the competency and the commitment necessary to do our jobs. So we can learn from these people. And that's the true value, I think, of history. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's actually a very timely conversation because I've done something like 120 shows or something so far this year. Good and we're going to the micro analyzing of, of carrier tactics and weaponry and leadership decisions here, there and everywhere. But actually, sometimes you just need to be reminded about trying to live your life well and trying to be a better person and trying to be inspiring of people around you and try and build people up rather than push them down. And it's fantastic to be able to discuss. We have the freedom to be able to discuss whether or not Monty was right to do this or whether or not the air power war was, should, should Nimitz have done this, Doolittle done that. They're all fantastic, those conversations, but we have those rights ultimately because most of us watching are living in a in a democracy we're living in a in a world yeah. where we can vote for our leaders change them when we don't like them we can speak freely and we can aspire to people like guys now who got us through world war ii along with a lot of incredible people under his command so i think we'll leave it at that um sure, i knew it would be a good show show colonel because you you you're, you're your almost brief cameo on the video games war game show was fantastic but i, I knew this would be a good one and it's just yeah, fantastic. Someone said you can come back on and talk about US Grant. It's quite it's not really within the World War II TV <laughs> remit, but I would love to. Would love to. Maybe it. we could talk about leadership in another way, you know, just military leadership. But but World War II has such a rich you know arena of of uh, of leadership uh lessons learned that there are many more stories that we could talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm gonna just remind people we've got coming up, and then I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks. As always, don't forget to like what we're doing on Twitter. Like the videos, comment on the videos, check out our, our um, social media presence. The links to the, uh, the Colonel's books are in the description below, John's website, Twitter account, what have you find out about. There's lots of stuff on YouTube where he's speaking to people that are worth watching. I was watching them earlier today. That's worth doing. Uh, tomorrow night, we've got James Fennel, Fennel on coming on to talk about the crossing of the Rhine, which is fantastic. Four Hours of Fury, 17th Airborne. Uh, interesting to look at the fact that there were other operations beyond the D-Day because paratroopers jumped out of aircraft on other occasions and that one there, Crossing of the Rhine, Varsity, fantastic. His book is incredible. He'll be an amazing speaker. And then it just keeps coming again and again and again, the shows over the next few days. Just check what we're doing on YouTube and keep keep supporting us. But right now, it remains me to, again to say thank you, Colonel, for joining us, your thank expertise. You. There's some serious bookshelf envy going on as well behind <laughs> you, uh, and that's great. So you're, you're always good value. You're welcome to come on any time, any time. And we could come on. We could do one about Brothers in Arms, do one about the the, the, the specific video games you've been involved in. That's another topic we could do. Sure, but I'd, I'd rather talk about uh, history and real people whenever we can. 
Absolutely. You are welcome yeah. anytime. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. Yeah. This is Paul Woodhead from World War Two TV saying join us again soon. Uh, you. I'm your host. I'll be with you again tomorrow night. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Cool.